going to get some material here today. If you have your Bible, turn to Genesis 126. Now, Father, I need wisdom, Lord. I need the gift of teaching. I need unction. And I pray, Heavenly Father, you'd anoint the word as it goes forth to touch the hearts of people and help them here today and then those that will hear it in the future. In Jesus' name I pray, bless his holy name, bless the righteous Son of God, amen. All right, now Genesis 1, 26, the Bible said, And God said, Let us make man in our image, and after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Now that's the biblical record. And the Bible's very clear about that. It says that God made man in his own image. Now what does that do? Well, that, uh, that separates man from the animal creation. It elevates him above all the animal creation and makes man superior to any living thing on this earth. That's what it does. It makes man superior ultimately, infinitely superior to anything. The book of Hebrews chapter 2 says, What is man that thou art mindful of him? This is a direct reference to man and mankind. Now, in the Bible, therefore, man is protected. The Bible said, Whosoever sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God created he him. To paraphrase it somewhat, I'm not quoting it uh, verbatim, but that's what it says. In plainer words, God put a protective cover over mankind, not to be killed as, uh, as the animal creation is, for simply for sport or for food, uh, but man is to be protected. Now this is found throughout the scripture, from Genesis to Revelation. That's the testimony of scripture. Charles Darwin, when he came out with his Origin of the Species, now read once again the title, the complete title of his book, because very, very few people today like to quote the full title. Very few. Here's the full title of his book, published in uh, November the 24th, 1859. On the origin of species by means of natural selection or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. Now that's what Darwin published and it became a bombshell. And when it went on the market, it absolutely turned the whole world upside down. It had a profound effect. Was Darwin original with evolution? Absolutely not. But Darwin, uh, I don't know, popularized it and made it scientific. And by doing that, uh, he plunged the world into an abyss. And you are living in that abyss today and have been ever since you were born. Uh, A few years back, back in the 90s, two teenage boys, Eric Harris and Dylan Klebo, Uh, went into Columbine High School, heavily armed, and shot to death 13 people and wounded a number of people. Say, what have they got to do with this? They've got a lot to do with it. Because they had talked before this event about how that the weak needed to die and the strong needed to survive. And on their T-shirts, when they went into that high school killing people, the T-shirt said, Natural Selection. What these two murderers did was carry it to its, to its uh, logical conclusion. You see, what Charles Darwin taught was that there is a struggle for life and the weak need to be eliminated because it will strengthen the strong. It will, it will ferret out the undesirables and will bring about the kind of uh, evolution that, uh, that Mother Nature, if that's who you want to say did it, that Mother Nature intended in the beginning. This was carried to its extremes in the German army back in the late 1800s, nearly 1900s, when World War I began. They charged masses of men into machine gun fire and mowed them down like you would mow grass. Millions died. The idea was that we are helping Mother Nature, we are eliminating uh, certain undesirables, and by watching this process, The strong are going to survive. So evolution began to take its its toll and establish its foundation. 
What Adolf Hitler did was to carry on with what had already been started in America. I'm going to read you something in a minute that has been all my life covered up. Uh, I've taught you before about eugenics, and I'll mention that again today, but I was never taught any of this in high school about the, uh, the origins of the Nazi movement it was not in Germany, it was in America. When I say the origins of the Nazi movement, I'm talking about their philosophy. They didn't call themselves, well, we had Nazi Americans, yes, back in the early uh, 1900s, but it's, they didn't call themselves Nazis. They were eugenicists. And this movement was quite an effective thing. Now, the reason I'm saying this is because I told you before that uh, the Hegelian dialect, thesis, antithesis, and synthesis, thesis, antithesis, and synthesis, in order to bring about a new world order or a one world government, they will plan decades ahead, even centuries, to uh, do it what they intend to do. You're watching right now the, the you're watching now the probably what we would say would be the the final the final uh, progression and manifestation of what's been in uh, it's, it's been working at for a long time. You're watching it right now. How many of you are aware that in the last few days that Planned Parenthood now has come under scrutiny because of uh, selling body parts of babies? And two callous doctors had been interviewed and showed a very callousness, uh, an enormous callousness about the human beings, the little babies that had been. And the way they do that uh, apparently is by partial birth abortion in order to save the body parts so they can sell them. And if you don't know what partial birth abortion is, it's one of the most... Uh, 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 wicked things that men have ever conceived. Amen. That's all I can say about it. It's wicked. It's, vi it's wicked. Seventy million children have died at the hands of these murderers. But in any event, uh, Planned Parenthood has come under fire in the last few days because they have been, uh, according to the testimony of these doctors, uh, they have been selling body parts now there is a uh, attorney out there in California who is going to uh, he's going to do a he's going to do a he's going to research whether or not the people who videoed them broke the law. Yeah. See how it goes? Yeah. You understand how vile these people are? But in any event, I don't want to get off track. I want to keep you on track with what we're talking about here. There is a systematic there's a system to it, and there's a logic to it. So they're creating an environment in this country, and they're doing it through, uh, through, the, uh, through abortion. They're doing it through the morality of the nation, sodomy. Uh, they're doing it through the, uh, the business establishment. They're doing it through all the areas that make up what you would call social Darwinism. How many ever heard of that term before? Social Darwinism is to be distinguished from biological Darwinism, in, the, in that biological Darwinism really is not something that you can observe because nobody's ever seen these transitional uh, things. But social Darwinism takes its foundation from the philosophy of Darwin of survival of the fittest and therefore humanity is evolving socially. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes and talk about its, uh, its effect on today and its ramifications for your life in the upcoming elections 2016. But in any event, uh, Fritz Springmeier, how many's ever heard of this man? All right, most of you haven't, maybe one or two. If you'll remember last week, I mentioned the pyramid. How many remember the pyramid I mentioned to you? I talked about the layers of the pyramid, and as it rises to the top, the nucleus gets smaller. In plainer words, there is a very small group who ultimately are ruling over everything else. And as you come down in the layers, it gets larger. And uh, can, you come, can, you, can you perceive what I'm talking about this morning? Can you see that how that, a, that presidents come and presidents go? But it seems like we continue on the same track. Oh, there's a little, there's a little difference in uh, conservatism and liberalism as far as, as, as social order is concerned, you know, and business and what have you. But the basic, the basic philosophy, the basic movement of the, of the, of the country it continues in the same direction. This is why Donald Trump is hated so much. It's not because he's a moral man or he's some great champion for, 
for the things that we as Christians believe, but it's because he's willing to step out into the public arena and say things that politicians won't say. And they hate him for it. And he's calling them on the carpet. And, uh, and, and, and by doing this, he's stirring the pot. And by doing this, he's bringing issues to the forefront that need to be debated, that people need to understand. This is what Trump's doing. And uh, they hate him for it. But he's surging in the polls because he is touching a nerve in America. And the people hear him saying the things publicly that they say in private. And the poll capticians won't say. <laughs> Amen. There's a problem there. So it'd be, it'd be interesting to observe how Trump continues and how this election cycle continues and to see what happens in the Republican Party. Uh, Cruz, uh, Senator Cruz, the senator from Texas, got up on the Senate floor the other day and accused the majority leader of the Senate of lying. Mitch McConnell is the senator from Kentucky and he got up on the floor, Cruz did, and accused him of lying. Now, folks, this is Republican against Republican. And so what's happening here is that you're coming to the forefront, things that just simply were uh, verboten before, taboo. You didn't do this, but it's happening. So it'll be interesting to watch how it goes. But the bottom line is that uh, this pyramid that Fritz Springmeier uh, has created. He, he, he says that he is an insider and that he understands the workings of the Illuminati or the Rothschilds or whoever's running the show. Now let me say this and I say it time and time and time again. I'm exactly like Will Rogers. All I know is what I read in the papers. What do you mean by that? I have no access to the top. I have no personal access to the hidden chambers of knowledge and to the people who are the movers and the shakers of the one world government. Do you? We are completely dependent upon what we can read that, that, uh, that, 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 that comes to us. But what we do look for is uh, some, some uh, consistency. We look for comparisons. We look for things that, that, uh, that make sense. And so uh, when he draws up this pyramid, I, I say to myself, this is the conclusion I came to before I ever saw this. I found this a couple of days ago. Now, how many of you know that there's a pyramid on a $1 bill? All right, and at the top of that pyramid is the eye of Horus. Now you can spin it any way you want to and make it mean this, and mean that, and mean this, and mean that. You can get into semantics till you turn blue in the face. But the bottom line is that there is a pyramid on the one dollar bill, and the top of it, you have the capstone to that pyramid, and you have an eye, the eye of Horus. Bottom line is that at the top of that, you have a small nucleus that's taking care of 16, uh, 17, uh, what's the date on the bottom of that thing? 1767? 1776, the date of the revolution, all right. 1776 is at the bottom of the pyramid, all right. It represents the, the, the 13 colonies that rebelled against King George, all right. But it may have a much deeper representation for those in the know, for the initiates. You see what I'm saying? When you get into the occult world, you have to understand there is the information that is fed, spoon-fed, to the, me, to the masses, but then there is, there, there is that knowledge that the initiate has, and only the initiate has that knowledge, and we have to, uh, we have to understand that. Now, I believe the Bible. I believe, according to the Scripture, that the final Gentile kingdom, I believe according to the Scripture, the final Gentile kingdom will have two legs and feet of iron and clay, and iron and clay do not mix. And it says in Scripture in the book of Daniel that they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Now that's not men mingling with men. That is obviously, it is pointing out something here that is, that is supernatural or there, that is paranormal, that it is not natural, it's not normal, that there's some kind of a spiritual element involved here that we need to take a close look at. So if we are, according to Scripture, I believe in the last days, then we must be close to that point or in that point where they are mingling themselves with the seed of men. Now, you remember what I told you last week about the two geneal genealogies in the New Testament? I told you it's very important to understand this. You've got a genealogy in Matthew and you've got a genealogy in Luke. 
The genealogy in Matthew is a royal genealogy, and the genealogy in Luke has to do with the essence of Christ, who he is, where he came from, what he's about, because it traces him all the way back to Adam. Adam. Now, the genealogy in Luke, chapter number 3, most believe is the genealogy of Mary. I tend to believe that too. The reason I believe that is because the seed of the woman is going to bruise the head of the serpent. The seed of the woman is a biological impossibility. It just doesn't work that way. So there must be a supernatural intervention for the woman to have a seed. The seed, therefore, is passed on by the father. So what the scripture is telling you is that the birth of the Messiah of Israel will literally be the seed of God, and when he's born, his father is going to be God. And the only way for that to happen will be a virgin birth. And so in Isaiah chapter number 7, he said, a virgin shall conceive, then he's certainly talking about what's going to happen. A virgin's going to conceive. Matthew believed it because Matthew quoted that very scripture and said a virgin's going to conceive. So we have the seed, now note carefully, the seed does not originate on this earth, so it could mix itself with the seed of men. The seed comes down from where? Comes down from God. John 6, he says, I am the bread that came down from heaven. So what we're doing here is looking at something about bloodlines and corruption of the race and all of this stuff. And when I say race, I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about uh, uh, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. I'm talking about humanity. And when you're talking about, when you're looking at that, the Bible says in the book of Genesis 6 that Noah was perfect in his generations. The Hebrew word for perfect is tanim. It means that he was a direct descendant of Adam with no admixture of fallen angels in his bloodline. That's what it meant. That's what it meant. And that obviously then that shows you that God wants you to know that he is protecting a certain bloodline so that when Mary is born, Mary will not have the DNA or the admixture of the corruption of fallen angels in her bloodline. See, wouldn't it be, a, wouldn't it be quite a thought this morning, folks, to think that the Lord Jesus Christ's mother was corrupted by, the, by, 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 a, by a supernatural bloodline? Then you're getting to Dan Brown territory. And uh, what, what's his book called? I can't, uh, the, the, the Da Vinci Code. You get into Dan Brown country where he makes millions of dollars on the idea that the Lord Jesus and Mary Magdalene had children. Just another man, in other words. So this is very important to understand that in Scripture, the Bible lays these things out in such a way where all it takes is just a cursory reading of the Word of God. And you begin to understand that God's hand is directly involved in the birth of people and where they come from and who they are. And Charles Darwin, when he postulated his theory of evolution, turned the whole thing upside down and said it is no longer in the hand of God who makes man after his own image. Now it is random chance. Random chance. In other words, you have no real reason for being here, so if we decide to knock you off before you're ever born, no big deal. We're going to kill 70 million of you. What's the big deal? Margaret Sanger said, useless eaters and human weeds. That's what she called them. So when they're selling body parts today in Planned Parenthood, they're true to their nature. There's nothing, there's nothing, you know, there's nothing different about that. What's the big deal? Who's surprised? If you can, if you can kill 70 million babies, innocent little children, well, what's the big deal about selling body parts? And if you live in a country that's willing to accept the murder of 70 million people, what's all the uproar about if you want to sell a few body parts? I mean, we can't be selective in our morality, can we? But we can be. Believe me, we can be very selective. When I say we, I speak it in the collective sense. I condemn them as every opportunity I get. We in the collective sense of Americans. That's the we that I'm talking about this morning. So sure, you can, uh, you know, you can, you can pick and choose, but of course there are political gain involved in it. And you know, you play the game and there's, there's all that's involved. And so that's what's going on with it. Now, what I'm trying to do is lead you somewhere. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to lead you up to something. Now let me just put it out here like this this morning. If, if, if these people, and since these people, let's put it this way, not if, but since these people are guilty of the blood of 70 million babies, do you think it would be a, 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 a huge step for them to kill off the old? Euthanasia, you know, would it be a big step? Kevorkian, you know, they called him Jack the, what do they call him, uh, Dr. Death, 
his name was Jack, Jack the Dripper, I think they called him. Uh, you know, it's a play on Jack the Ripper that they never found over there in London that killed the prostitutes. Uh, they never found him. Uh, but in any event, uh, you know, it's, it's a play on words, Jack the Dripper, the, the killing. Uh, let's, let's get rid of them. I mean, a after all, uh, what quality of life do you have? What do you mean quality of life? Life's in the hands of God. God chooses the quality of life. Uh, I've never heard anybody say that to uh, Richard Dawkins. Or Dawkin, what's it, is it S or N? No S. Richard Dawkin. Uh, Hawking. Rich, Stephen Hawking. Stephen Hawking, the one that has, that's in the wheelchair. You know, he has a debilitating, what has he got, mus muscular st uh, uh, MS. But whatever it is, have you heard anybody recently say anything to him about quality of life? No, it's very selective when it comes to that. And did you know that... <coughs> <clears throat> Mr. Hawking has been in the news in the last few days. Uh, he's pushing a movement now. They're going to spend a few million dollars to try to contact aliens. And did you know that word is coming out of CERN, Switzerland? You remember the Hadron Collider, 17 miles long, 300, 300 uh, 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 feet below the surface of the earth. The Hadron Collider, where they're colliding these new, uh, protons and what have you that now they are discovering stuff showing up inside that vacuum tube shouldn't be there. They're having experiences that they shouldn't be having. And Brutalochi said plainly, he's the director of the thing, that uh, we're gonna open doors into other dimensions. Here's, 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 here's the thing. What you give out for public consumption is for public consumption for the masses, but most of the time it masks your real purpose. What are you really at? What are you up to? What are you doing? It's like the mafia when they, when they clean money. They, what do they call it? When they, they launder it, they launder their money. Well, that's it, that's, that's, for, that's for public consumption. So what are they really doing over there? Well, they've got Shiva dancing around out in the front of it, and Shiva the, is the uh, destroyer and he's the destroyer, not for the purpose of destroying, but for the purpose of bringing about a new thing, a new existence, for opening doors, portals into another dimension. That's what they're trying to do. And the devil gets blamed for a lot of things, and I'm certainly no apologist for the devil, but I'll tell you this right now. If there was, ever was an opportunity for Satan to jump in the middle of something, it's CERN, Switzerland. You better believe it, it's CERN. If he ever wanted to jump in somewhere, and begin, to, uh, and begin to pull off some deceit, it's CERN, Switzerland. So folks, be careful. Revelation chapter number nine says, I saw the bottomless pit open, and they had an angel over it whose name was Abaddon and Apollyon. Now, Adolf Hitler was a disciple of Margaret Sanger. Margaret Sanger was a disciple of Charles Darwin, and on and on and on it goes. You see, you have a direct connection all the way back to the beginning. Darwin, one day, folks, is going to stand in judgment for what he started. He's going to have to answer for it. He's got to answer for it. What he did, uh, uh, though, was to bring it under the, uh, under the umbrella of science. It is scientific evolution. And what he did by doing that was to destroy the whole educational system in our country. Amen. He destroyed the, 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 uh, the, 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 many of the churches because they began to preach theistic evolution. God used evolution, but God did it. And on and on and on it goes. The effect of Darwinism today, uh, there is no way that you can fully measure it. It is a profound effect upon everything that you do in your daily life. The philosophy of this world of today, of the idea that life is cheap and that man has no real purpose in here except like the hedonist says, just to eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. We're here today, we're gone tomorrow. You know, there's no judgment, no God, no hereafter. That's Darwinism. Darwinism says that you are a product of random chance. Now there's a problem. When you go to the public school system, that gets rammed down your throat. And, uh, and, you, are, and you, are, uh, you are required to learn the tenets of Darwinism, of evolution. Now, Adolf Hitler took Darwinism 
And he took the idea of eugenics that, uh, that Margaret Sanger, she did not originate eugenics, that originated with, uh, with, with scientists, but the idea was that we can, we, can, we can breed out characteristics we don't want in people and breed in the characteristics we do want. How do they get that? By observing horses. You up here to Kentucky and see these horses that run in that Kentucky Derby, folks, they're not $10 horses. <laughs> They've got millions and millions and millions of dollars involved in them. And they breed those horses generation after generation after generation after generation. And you let a horse become a winner of the Triple Crown like we just had. That's the first time in, what was it, 30 years or so? The Triple Crown, the one at Kentucky Dermot, Derby, the Belmont Stakes, and the Preakness. You win all three of them, you've won the Triple Crown. You are the top dog in the, in the, in the, in the, in the horse world. That horse is put out for stud, and that horse makes millions of dollars to its owners. Why? Because they know that you can breed certain characteristics into living flesh. In the book of John, chapter number one, it says, which were born, talking about us, born again, born by the grace of God, which were born, not of the will of the flesh, now note carefully, or of blood. That has to do with breeding, which were born, not of blood. In other words, you're not a born again Christian because you're a Caucasian. You're not a born again believer because you're an Italian or an African. You're a born again believer because man's problem is not breeding. Man's problem is sin. And the Bible makes it very clear. Our problem is sin. Whereas by one man's sin, death entered the world and death passed upon all men for all have sinned. White people don't go to heaven and black people go to hell. Sinners go to heaven. Uh, uh, saved sinners go to heaven and unsaved sinners go to hell. Red, yellow, black, and white. It makes no difference. That's the problem. But you got these people on there and I got on a website yesterday that's so racist to the core, man, I'm telling you right now. It is this, it is this blonde-haired, blue-eyed, uh, Nordic. And this is what came out of Darwinism because in the late 1800s, they begin to work at that philosophy that we can breed the blonde-haired, blue-eyed, Nordic. Now, you say, that's, that's Hitler. No, that was in America. I want to read you something. Long before Adolf Hitler, what he did was, what he, did was uh, uh, he was nationalistic in it. In other words, he gave the Germans their identity by doing that. You understand how most people, their identity is forged by somebody telling them they are what they are. You realize that most churches operate that way. You've got a pastor that, that teaches the people that you are what you are, and so therefore they become what he tells them they are. Well, the Bible, the Apostle Paul says, I am what I am by the grace of God. See, that's what Scripture says. What's that mean? That means we're all unique. God doesn't work with cookie-cutter religion. One size doesn't fit all. We didn't all come the same way to Christ, but we all came to the same Christ. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Some of you didn't crawl out of the hell hole I crawled out of. But thanks be unto God, I went to Christ. I came to the one that he could save me and, and wrote my name, the Lamb's Book of Life. That's the point. And it takes that arrogant, uh, condescending pride away from the individual who looks down at other people because he's a blue blood. You remember what I told you a blue blood was? Say, so what's a blue blood? A blue blood is the palace, king, queen, and children who are not out in the heat of the day being suntanned, working in the fields. And so therefore their skin gets lighter and lighter and that you can look at them and you can see the blood coursing in the veins and did you notice it looks blue? That's where they got the term blue blood. Now what's that mean? That came to mean a whole group of people who were the nobility. Society's laid out like this. You have the first estate, which is the church or the so-called clergy. You have the second estate, which is the nobility, the ruling class. Then you have the third estate, which is the peon out in the field, the guy that goes to work every day and he sweats and he gets calluses on his hands. Now you've got the fourth estate, 
You know who that is? That's the news media. Now, each one contributes its part to civility and humanity. First estate, second estate, third estate. But the fourth estate controls the very thinking of men. And you're dealing with that right now. Donald Trump told the Iowa uh, Register, I think is the name of that newspaper out there, it's the largest paper in Iowa, and they did a, a scathing criticism of him not too long ago, and the reporters, I don't, not too flattering what they said about Donald Trump. And so Trump, uh, this weekend or next weekend, he had this political uh, uh, party out there, they were doing something, this and that, and of course the media comes in, the fourth estate, they come in to cover it. Well, Trump told a bunch from the Iowa, uh, the, uh, what I call it, the, the newspaper? Register. He said, don't show. <laughs> You're not welcome. If anything will make a reporter gnash at his teeth, <laughs> it is that. You remember Hillary not too long ago when she marched down the street somewhere? I don't remember where it was. She had rope. She had a rope all the way around her, and that rope was to keep the reporters out. And she said, it works better that way. People can see me, you know, and I can project the image I desire to project and what have you. The bottom line is that the fourth estate can destroy you if God doesn't intervene. They call it yellow journalism. The fourth estate can bolster the propaganda that comes out of the educational establishment about Darwinism. Do you know of any members of the fourth estate, and I'm talking about as a unity, that do not, that, that do not uh, 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 support, that do not excitedly push the idea of Darwinism? Do you know any? Do you know any newspapers that are anti-evolution? Do you know any of the news media, CBS, NBC, ABC, Fox, CNN, MSNBC, the rest of them? Uh, the Gannett newspaper uh, conglomerate, uh, Rupert Murdoch, do you know that this man, Rupert Murdoch, he controls most of the news coverage in this country? Uh, do you know of any of these in the news media that are, that are uh, anti-evolution? In other words, they have a statement on their page that we do not support Darwinism, and we believe that a person should have freedom, that if they want to read Darwin, fine, but if you want to read scientific design, that's fine also. That you should have an opportunity to debate it and make a decision which way that you want to go with it. Do you know of any? What does that tell you about America? Think about it. Think about the entire news media in this country. Now, there are individuals, say Fox, for example, there are individuals on Fox who are certainly not uh, Darwinist. They're creationists. Uh, some of them are Christian. No question. Maybe even some of the other networks that are true believers. But as far as the network is concerned, the fourth estate, that's where you are. There is no debate in this country. If you try to say anything against Darwin, you're immediately ostracized. You're kicked out. And that's it. No debate. That shows you how coexisting they are, how liberal they are, how all-inclusive they are, how understanding they are. You disagree with them and they'll cut your throat. I'm gonna tell you again, a progressive liberal will put you in the ground. I'm telling you again, this world is ruled by an elite class of, of, uh, of the white brotherhood, if you wanna call it that, who believe that they are vastly superior to the morons and to the lower weed, useless eaters and the weeds that are below them, and that they will stop at nothing to bring about a one world government where they are at the top. And that's where we're headed. And these people will do exactly what they intend to do. They are going to bring in the Antichrist. That's where we're at. We're close to it. Now, this thing about uh, about um, about uh, eugenics in America, the, the horrid condition. I thought I had it with me here. Apparently I didn't, but I thought I brought it. <clears throat> but I wanted, oh, here it is, here it is. The swastika threw me off. <clears throat> and I marveled every time I drive down a certain road here in town, there's a swastika right out there on the, right out in front of it. 
I marvel. I think I've, I've told my wife how many times I said, "That's a swastika." And these people are just driving by, you know, and they're headed for McDonald's, and they're going here, and they're listening to their cell phones, and here, and here, and here. And this swastika is sitting right there in front of that building. And I thought to myself, it's just a little different from the swastikas you normally see, but it is a swastika, no question about it. Don't ask me where it is. I'm not going to tell you. Just drive around and look, and you'll see it. Now, this is the classic swastika. Hitler took the swastika, rearranged it, and projected it a certain way. And uh, this is what we've got. He did not create the swastika. The swastika. You'll find swastikas in Buddhism. They're all over the place. Swastikas are old. They've been around for centuries. But Hitler was a nationalist. He gave the Germans pride. He caused them to believe that they were masters of the universe, the master race. It was all about them. And so he appealed to their, to their history, to their mythology, and all of that. He created all of that for the, for the German. But listen to this. This is so important. Hitler and his henchmen victimized an entire continent, exterminated millions in his quest for a so-called master race. But the concept of a white, blonde-haired, blue-eyed, master Nordic race didn't originate with Hitler. The idea was created in the United States and cultivated in California. Decades before Hitler came to power, California eugenicists played an important, although little known, role in the American eugenics movement's campaign for ethnic cleansing. Did you know that tens of thousands of Americans were sterilized in the early 1900s? Did you know that? Did you know that they were forced to, they were stopped from marrying certain people? That they intervened in these people? That they, that they literally became a, a uh, what do you want to call it? A tyrant, an authoritarian, tyrannical government. Eugenics was the racist pseudoscience determined to wipe away all human beings deemed unfit, preserving only those who conform to a Nordic stereotype. Now, by the way, here's, what, here's this paper I'm reading is from George Mason University, just in case you thought I got it on Vine Avenue, or I picked it up over here at the hill, laying in a gutter somewhere. This came from George Mason University. And the elements of the philosophy was enshrined as national policy by forced sterilization and segregation laws, as well as marriage restrictions enacted in 27 states in 1909, California became the third state to adopt such laws. Ultimately, eugenics practitioners coercively sterilized some 60,000 Americans, barred the marriage of thousands, forcibly segregated thousands in colonies, and persecuted untold numbers in ways we are just learning. Before World War II, nearly half of coercive sterilizations were done in California, and even after the war, the state accounted for a third of all such surgeries. Boy, California was considered the epicenter of the American eugenics movement. During the 20th century's first decades, California's eugenicists included potent but little known race scientists, such as Army venereal disease specialist Dr. Paul Popino, citrus magnet and polytechnic benefactor Paul Gosney, Sacramento banker Charles Goth, as well as members of the California State Board of Charities and Corrections, the University of California Board of Regents. Now listen carefully, listen carefully. Eugenics would have been so much bizarre parlor talk had it not been for extensive financing by corporate philanthropists, especially the Carnegie Institute, the Rockefeller Foundation, and the Harriman Railroad Fortune. They were all in league with some of America's most respected scientists hailing from such prestigious universities as Stanford, Yale, Harvard, and Princeton. These, ac these ac academicians espoused race theory and race science and then faked and twisted data to serve eugenics racist aims. Stanford President David Starr Jordan originated the notion of race and blood in his 1902 racial epistle, Blood of a Nation, in which the university scholar declared that human qualities and conditions such as talent and poverty were passed through the blood. 
Then they had an idea about what to do to get rid of some of these undesirables. Listen, this is what George Mason University article is saying. This was in America. Listen carefully. The most commonly suggested method of eugenicide in America was a lethal chamber or public locally operated gas chambers. 1918, Pope Ono, the Army Venereal Disease Specialist during World War I, co-wrote the widely used textbook Applied Eugenics, which argued, quote, from an historical point of view, the first method which presents itself is execution. Its value in keeping up the standard of the race should not be underestimated. Applied Eugenics also devoted a chapter to lethal selection, which operated through the destruction of the individual by some adverse feature of the environment, such as excessive coal, bacteria, or by bodily deficiency. On and on and on it goes. For the sake of time, I can't read all of it, but I suggest that you get it and read it yourself. I'll leave this right here. You can do the reference. George Mason University. I'm simply reading what these scholars have put out about the scholars. Yes, sir. What he just said was UNICEF, which is a UN agency, United Nations uh, something, EI, whatever that is, acronym for something. The UNICEF in Africa is giving sterilization shots to these women down there, and they know about it, and they're running away from them. Say, so, oh, that was back in 19, no, this is, what, 2015? It's happening right now. And so what about the pogroms down there? And what about the civil wars down there? And what about the... Uh, famines down there. In other words, it seems to me like whatever's happening in Africa is happening there because that somebody wants it to happen and they're enjoying it while it happens and they're getting rid of the useless eaters and the human weeds and on and on and on it goes. Now here's the problem. When you start connecting all of that with what's going on today, it gets very, very, uh, what's the word for embarrassing? Do you know that Hillary Rodham Clinton has said that one of her greatest heroes is Margaret Sanger. Yes, sir. They don't trust him. They don't trust, right, they don't, and rightfully so. Of course, it's costing them dearly with, with this Ebola thing. But uh, you, you understand that uh, our president, uh, your president, uh, the president, uh, is, in, <laughs> is in Kenya right now. <laughs> and that uh, he goes down there with his evangelistic message about sodomy. You understand that he's, he's, uh, he's treating this with evangelistic fervor. He's preaching this stuff all over the world. And the people in Kenya push back and say, we don't want that down here. Good for the people in Kenya. Amen. Hallelujah for the Kenyan people. Yes, sir. Exactly. Wasn't he one of them that was called a robber baron? Yes. Along with, uh, exactly. The idea was we're strong, we're wealthy, and so therefore it's only right that you work for $7 a week or $10 a week. And we are worth, and it's obvious that Mother Nature has shined upon us, and this is natural selection, and so the process, and here we are, and so you just bow down and bow under to your karma. Because essentially, that's what karma. Is. That's what that's that's uh, that's what they're t preaching. All right, we'll run out of time. We'll pick it up again next week. How many of you are mad? <laughs> you see what's going on? It ain't pretty. We'll pick it up next week. Father, bless the study of your word now in thy holy name. Amen.